I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, Rupert Murdoch's multi billion dollar bet. But will he need to sell the family silver to pay for the deal of a lifetime? We examine Murdoch's bid to buy the owner of CNN, Time Warner. Also this week, Malaysia Airlines, two lost planes, two unimaginable tragedies. It could well be the end of an airline. We explore whether Malaysia can recover or whether its passengers will simply look elsewhere. Plus, who's actually helping who? Benevolent rich nations claim to give aid to Africa, but what are they getting back? You know, he is 83 years old and just proved he still has the power, the sway and the influence to completely shake up the media world. Of course, we are talking about Rupert Murdoch and his audacious bid for Time Warner, the owner of the original 24-hour news channel, CNN, also HBO television and the Warner Brothers Film Studios. Going by his past record, Murdoch usually gets what he wants. The big question, though, is why does he want this and why now? After all, look at what the man already owns and controls. This is the new Fox News Channel app, streamlined to help you surf the stories that matter and stay connected. See, don't you? This is big business we're talking about. And the key here is consolidation. The pay TV providers, names like Comcast, Time Warner Cable, Dish, AT&T, they are all going through mergers. Therefore, owning even more content would give Murdoch more clout in negotiations. Let's walk you through it here. Murdoch, or rather his company, 21st Century Fox, has offered to buy Time Warner for more than $75 billion. That would mostly be paid with shares in 21st Century Fox. 40% though would be paid in cash. According to the Financial Times, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan would provide a loan of $25 billion, while Murdoch will sell the Sky Italia business and his stake in Sky Deutschland to British Sky Broadcasting for $8.3 billion. So there's potentially more cash there. And don't forget, Fox owns 39% of B Sky B. That could be up for sale too, which would raise around another $9.6 billion. But here's the bit that's got people in news circles talking. Murdoch, of course, already owns Fox News Channel in the United States, which creates a few problems given his would-be acquisition is the parent company of CNN. So to get regulatory approval for the deal, Murdoch may well have to sell off CNN, which could raise as much as $10 billion. But this may well be a drawn-out battle. You know, Time Warner's already rejected the $85 a share offer. It says, we're well, fine, thank you very much, we can go it alone. So if Murdoch wants success, he may well need to bump up that offer to around $100 a share. So there's lots to talk about, and we're going to do that with Claire Enders, who is the founder of the uh, telecoms media and technology firm Enders Analysis, joining us from London. Claire Rupert gets what Rupert wants, usually, doesn't he? I don't want to be so blunt about it, but can we say with some sort of safety that Time Warner will eventually succumb to an increased offer? I don't think you can say that with certainty. First of all, because the defense mechanism that is in place that was put in place almost a week ago is in place until next June. This is the measure that requires over 15% of shareholders to approve an EGM. Mm. And this is really a safety block on a group of shareholders ganging together and forcing Time Warner to accept perhaps a higher offer. I mean, definitely commentators have all said, you know, the offer has to be higher. And indeed, many have said that a core stumbling block is, is any kind of element which is non-voting stock of Fox, because that really puts center stage the issue of whether the combination is going to be better run uh, by you know, the Murdoch family and Chase Carey and, and other executives, but Chase Carey is only uh, in his, has a contract that only goes for two years. So there are a lot of issues over the governance of the combined entity, which Time Warner's board has guided towards suggesting that both there are going to be very significant regulatory obstacles to the combination. Mm. And so 
Actually, we're a long way away from a conclusive answer to your question. OK, so let's pick up then, Claire, on the regulatory issue, because that is significant. Actually, we'll do that in a moment. First, I want to look at, well, actually, just taking a step back for our viewers here, because I want you to explain exactly why. Why is Rupert Murdoch making this play, and why do it now? You know, he's getting late in, late in the day for him, let's say. Well, I mean, he's 83 years old. You know, 30 years ago, he made a run at Warner's. Um, you know, the company has, has had extraordinary success in the last 15 years, in particular with the growth of HBO, in particular with the emergence of the Harry Potter franchises and the franchises that go with being J.K. Rowling's preferred filmmaker. And, you know, the company has immensely increased its value also by shedding uh, its, its magazine unit as well as its Time Warner cable unit, which is in play with Comcast, which is seeking regulatory approval, uh, and that may well be finalized. So the company has slimmed down, mm -hmm. and as a result, Time Warner is now able to be taken over. Before, Time Warner could not be taken over, mm. probably by any company on the planet Earth, because it was so significant, so large. And indeed, one of the issues around the Time Warner siege, if you want to call mm. it that, will be that there could be only a handful of companies in the world that would make a counter offer for that asset, perhaps two or three. So actually, for Rupert Murdoch, this deal would be defining because mm. it would combine these extraordinary assets. These global franchises are very valuable to any company that would own them. And, and of course, it would give Mr. Murdoch and 20th, 21st Century Fox a, a, a really significant role in terms of determining the outcomes of all the other parts of the value chain, whether the, on the distribution side or on the retail side. Right, distribution. Uh, you started to mention that there, so let's focus on it for a moment. This whole sort of, you know, tussle and consolidation amongst all the cable operators themselves. Again, I wonder if you can explain that to our viewers and I guess how it plays into this, understanding that the content versus platform side of things. Well, I mean, we've seen <clears throat> a very large number of moves of, in terms of consolidation around cable assets. So you've seen Liberty Global buy Virgin Media last year, plus make a bid for Ziggo, which is c currently going through regulatory approval. Comcast making a bid for Time Warner Cable. And then you've also seen the entry of over-the-top players like Netflix, mm. like Amazon Streams, and so on. So you've got the emergence of many different kinds of business models on the distribution side. So yes, I mean, this... You know, the, although, you know, this is a, in European terms, this would be uh, a reduction from six to five studios. U.S. studios dominate film production and distribution around the world. It would have greater impact than that in terms of the actual market share of this entity, which is why, you know, there is regulatory risk of considerable significance attached to this transaction. Uh, quick final word on CNN, if you wouldn't mind, the theory being that Rupert Murdoch can't own both Fox News Channel and CNN. Uh, ergo, who might be interested in buying up CNN, do you think? Well, CBS has announced that it would look at the property, and perhaps other organizations would. But, you know, CNN has always been part of the Time Warner family and has always felt strong and well-resourced uh, and perhaps uh, even indulged in its international operation from time to time. And it has been very strongly associated with the very high-quality production values that are Time Warner's heartland. Mm. Any acquirer might well have to reduce the spread of that operation, might have to reduce its glossiness and, and the resources that support it in order to pay back an acquisition price. So it, it isn't going to be good news for CNN to change hands, that's for sure. Um, and it will have an impact on, on the quality of, of CNN's material if that occurs and the price paid is too high, much as would occur if Mr. Murdoch ends up by overpaying for Time Warner. Claire Enders from Enders Analysis. We thank you so much for your time talking Rupert Murdoch this week. And still ahead on Counting the Cost, Malaysia Airlines. One plane lost, another shot down. How does any airline recover from that? We'll look at that a little later in the program. Uh, right now, though, Africa and the commonly held view that generous, wealthy countries give billions in aid to the continent, which they do. 
But a new report suggests that notion is actually a smokescreen for politicians and corporations to plunder Africa's vast resources. Take a look at this. Aid to Africa amounts to less than $30 billion a year with total inflows of $134 billion. However, $46.3 billion disappears each year in profits made by the multinationals who come in. Then $21 billion goes on debt payments, while illegal fishing and logging costs more than $18 billion. Put it all together and Africa's losing $192 billion a year, which is no good when you remember our inflows number of $134 billion. And that's all just what we can quantify. Who knows how much more is lost in illicit money, squirreled away in tax havens and money loans to other governments. The man behind this report is Martin Drury, Director of Health Poverty Action, joining us from London this week. Martin, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here and, and I'm condensing your report down into a handful of words, but the idea that this aid is a smokescreen for the plundering of these countries, talk me through that one because it's, it's a fairly, well, it's quite a statement, let's put it that way. It is, and um, at Health Poverty Action, we were becoming increasingly concerned that whenever uh, development issues were discussed uh, in the media in the UK, the only message in the room, the only understanding in the room was that Africa is dependent on the charity of uh, uh, the, the global north, countries like the UK. And the only debate was whether or not at a time when we're going through hard times ourselves, mm. we can continue to be so generous to the poor. And at Health Public Action, well, of course, we know that that wasn't the whole truth, but we didn't have the figures to, to demonstrate it. So what we wanted to do was, uh, and we did this in partnership with a number of uh, both African and Northern NGOs, was to uh, quantify the uh, inflows to Africa and, and the outflows. And, and what it uh, clearly shows is that um, aid is a, a tiny proportion of the true picture. And that leads to uh, totally uh, false conclusions in terms of the understanding of the public, which in turn leads to the wrong kinds of political pressure. Okay, so uh, what could have, well, what sort of effect could this have? Because if already the perception is that money is just flowing in, wouldn't this possibly make that worse? You know, people will start saying, oh, well, you know, they're not even using the money properly anyway, so why should we be giving them any more? Well, it's not the question of whether or not the money's been used properly. And we're not saying that aid doesn't make a difference. Uh, I know that debate happens elsewhere. Um, we, we know that uh, aid can make a difference to the poor. What we're saying is that the money that uh, the rich world such as my own country, the UK, takes out of Africa far, far exceeds the amount that it gives back as aid. So if the perception is that actually in the UK we're the, the generous benefactors of Africa, it leads the public to totally different um, emotional relations, mm. intellectual relations, political understanding about the true relationship than if they know the truth that we're taking out more than we're giving. And the trouble with, uh, we describe aid as, as a smoke screen. The, tr the trouble is that um, if all the attention, and as NGOs, you know, we're responsible also. You know, we constantly, constantly campaign for more aid, ask the money to give public, as though that's the solution to poverty. And it's understandable if people are going through hard times themselves, they're mm. gonna get yeah. frustrated with that, that ongoing message. If instead we highlight attention on the reasons that money has been unfairly taken Africa, uh, out of Africa, illicit uh, tax dodging, uh, unfair um, burdens of uh, the distribution of uh, uh, unfair distribution of the burdens of climate change, debt repayments, unfair terms of trade, if that is brought to public attention, then instead, you know, I as a UK citizen don't feel irritated with Africa for being constantly reliant on my charity. I feel outraged at the causes of that mass poverty in the first place. Now, as NGOs, that's what we should be focusing attention on. Okay, so you've made some good points there about the illicit money, the sort of stuff that can't be controlled or tracked, or at least it's more difficult to control or track them. What about the money that goes out in the form of, of corporate profits, a company that is domiciled elsewhere, therefore the money goes there? I mean, that's what companies are there to do, no? Make a profit? Uh, well, they are there to turn a profit as an individual company, yes, but um, the, uh, one of the biggest outflows from Africa is the repatriation of profits by large multinationals. Now, um, 
the, those multinationals have very often benefited from uh, uh, biased rules that uh, uh, regulate international trade. Um, they've used their lobbying power and, uh, uh, you know, supported by the likes of the IMF, supported by, uh, uh, again, unfair trade negotiations at, uh, at the World Trade Organization, to allow them to dominate African markets with African governments being denied the same policy tools that governments like my own have used to develop um, the uh, uh, commercial strength of these multinationals in the first place, the, the right to protect our own markets while those companies are developing, the right to subsidize those companies until they become strong enough to compete. So you know, it, it's unfair that those countries are able, those companies are able to uh, enter African markets, dominate those markets, and then repatriate the profits out of Africa back to the UK. Martin Drury, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time. Finally this week, Malaysia Airlines. And before we go on, I do want to say that in this segment, we are very much focusing on the fate of the company, its business reputation and its future. That is, of course, not in any way to forget about the 537 people who've lost their lives in these dual airliner tragedies. But this is something we want to look at, dual tragedies, unpredictable, unimaginable events, and how, maybe if, Malaysia Airlines can in fact carry on. And the ideas of bankruptcy or going into private hands are options being considered by Malaysia's state-run investment fund, which is the majority shareholder. But it's worth pointing out that Malaysia Airlines' problems predate both MH17 and MH370. Over the past years, losses have ballooned to $1.3 billion, which in itself isn't surprising given what a tough industry aviation already is. But now more losses are on the way. Malaysia has about a billion dollars in cash to last possibly until the end of the year. And you've got the $50 billion uh, state fund, Kazana Nacional, which would have to fork out $315 million to buy the 31% of Malaysia it doesn't already own. That shouldn't be a tall order for a well-resourced state fund, but like we said before, how many shocks can one airline handle? Florence Louis in Kuala Lumpur looks at the options under consideration to revitalise Malaysia Airlines. Malaysia Airlines has long been the pride of the nation. But this year, the state-owned carrier is dealing with what no other airline has had to deal with. Two major disasters within four and a half months. In March, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 took off from Kuala Lumpur, bound for Beijing, and then went missing. It still hasn't been found. As with the first tragedy, there was a similar outpouring of public sympathy when someone shot down flight MH17 over Ukraine. Now, industry analysts are wondering how Malaysia Airlines will cope with the loss of two passenger jets after operating at a financial loss for the last three years. From what we, we last understood, it had about three billion ringgit worth of cash. Um, the management had uh, stated that the cash was sufficient to, to last it till the end of the year. Uh, but with this incident, it will probably be less than that. It's unlikely the government will allow the company to go bankrupt. It's more likely the company will be privatised, a decision that analysts say could be announced within weeks. But it may be even more difficult to deal with the public perception that the airline is somehow associated with bad luck. In a nutshell, short term probably no uh, to Malaysia Airlines for, for the moment, but uh, probably after a while. This can happen to any airline, so it doesn't matter what airline. It's not Malaysian Airlines fault. Officials at Malaysia Airlines say there hasn't been an unusual increase in cancellations or requests for refunds. But its brand has taken a beating and will take time to recover. And given the company's finances, the route to recovery may have to involve restructuring, possibly even a delisting from the stock exchange. So what future for Malaysia Airlines? Let's talk to aviation consultant John Strickland about that. Look, John, when I first heard about MH17, uh, apart from the shock of, a, of another accident and all those poor people who'd lost their lives, my, my second thought was, that's the end of Malaysia Airlines, surely. You know, Pan Am doesn't exist anymore, uh, TWA doesn't exist anymore, and, and I was thinking, gosh, is Malaysia going to go the same way? What do you think? 
Well, of course, Malaysia has not been in the best of financial health for a long time. Uh, they made a significant loss last year. They were already uh, talking about, indeed, implementing a number of aspects of uh, restructuring of the business. To have two uh, very tragic incidents in close proximity doesn't help. It, it has a very significant direct business effect in, in terms of passengers uh, no longer booking on the airline, particularly uh, after the MH370. We saw loss of uh, Chinese business. Malaysia has offered the opportunity for refunds for the rest of this year to existing passengers. So there is a big dent in business that again leads to a, a drain in cash and it will take an enormous amount of effort by the management to be able to get through that uh, if they're going to succeed in not only surviving but then uh, restructuring to become a successful profitable airline for the future. We on this program a few weeks ago looked at the airline industry and what a difficult industry it is to operate in. Um, is that what Malaysia was suffering from just downturn in the industry or did it have its own set of problems that have led to such bad financial losses? I think it's, it's been a combination of two factors. Uh, on the one hand, they are in a, a very buoyant part of the aviation world with uh, uh, growth in, in air travel, uh, perhaps the strongest part of, part of the world in which they ought to be able to take opportunities from. On the other hand, that is a, a part of the globe which is very heavily competed. We've got uh, every kind of competition. There are very strong uh, legacy carriers such as uh, relatively close by Singapore Airlines. Mm -hmm. There are the Gulf carriers uh, <coughs> who fly actively into this region, again, well known for quality of service and competitive uh, products. Uh, and of course we have uh, the, the neighbouring airline based in Malaysia, uh, which is AirAsia, the, the regional low-cost carrier which offers both short-haul and long-haul flights. So all types of competition surround the company. But the fact that the, the, the airline uh, uh, is still uh, publicly owned, that, that it has been prone to uh, instability, uh, interference in the management process by politicians, that's never a help. You could draw parallels perhaps with the experience that uh, Alitalia has gone through uh, in Europe. And then there's the issue, John, and it feels just a little bit coarse to talk about this, but still, it's the, it's the company's reputation. It is in tatters, and it's not all its own fault. We have to say that it could have been any airline that was flying over Ukraine at that time. Uh, I mean, how do you even begin to repair reputation amongst customers and passengers? Well, whenever an airline uh, uh, faces uh, crises of this kind, uh, and of course uh, every airline would uh, wish to avoid uh, having to do so, the, the key uh, focus initially, and indeed continuously, has to be very good communication. Uh, there has to be proactive communication. It has to be as transparent as possible. Mm. Of course, the, the empathy and sympathy has to be shown for the, the family members that are affected by uh, the loss of, of these two flights. And I think there were lessons to be learned from uh, the initial handling of the MH370 uh, disappearance, mm. not only with Malaysian, but also with uh, other players such as uh, the government at the time. I think some of those lessons have been learned in the response to the, the current tragedy of the uh, MH17. But that doesn't stop. Uh, there has to be uh, evidence that uh, there is good communication, but backed up by demonstrating that the company is indeed well run, that there is uh, uh, maximum attention to safety and security, as well as the, the, the more uh, qualitative elements and the more pleasant elements such as customer service on a day-to-day -day mm. basis. John, what are your thoughts about, and this is quite broad brush here, but about turning around a, a, a loss-making airline, uh, even if you strip out all the problems, very unique problems that Malaysia has right now, uh, what has to be done in this current environment to actually make some money? Because this is the thing, airlines per passenger don't make a lot of money. No, you're quite right to say that. And uh, uh, we have seen uh, both successes and failures in airline turnarounds. It, you know, there's no doubt the management has its work cut out. Uh, I don't believe, however, that it is impossible. We've seen airlines in the past uh, turn around. It takes time. But it's a, a matter of internally winning the battle of hearts and minds. Uh, Malaysia has difficulties in its union relationships. That leads to holdbacks in terms of uh, overall staffing levels, uh, manpower productivity. Uh, the company's in the process of renewing quite an elderly fleet that mm. process has begun uh, not least with the Airbus A380 the, the, the long-haul aircraft which is now operating for the airline but that of course comes with costs in terms of uh, uh, investments needed to to re-equip uh, getting out there and offering the right products to customers and the right pricing if we look aside from recent accidents the mm. airline has actually done well uh, until recently in attracting traffic all these factors are key if Malaysia is going to uh, survive for the future John Strickland on Malaysia Airlines good to talk to you thank you and that's our show for this week. More for you online, though, at aljazeera.com slash programs. We break the show down into individual features and links for you there so you can get the full picture and follow the comments that have been posted uh, on social media as well. Speaking of which, 
You can join that conversation too by tweeting either me, at Kamal AJE, our business editor, at Abid Oliver Ali, and there's the hashtag counting the cost to use as well. Please use that, or just drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. Mm -hmm.